we'll be hearing first from Dr. Ken Shaheen. He is the Senior Vice President of Ancestry.com, well-known online resource for family history, and General Manager for Ancestry DNA, where he leads the development and commercialization of population genetics at the website, which is the same name, AncestryDNA.com. Dr. Shaheen is also Professor of Law at the University of Utah, held various positions in the biotechnology industry, including President and CEO of uh, Avigen. Dr. Shaheen, thank you. It's good to have you with us. Yes, you do. Please push the button. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. So um, I decided, uh, given the limited time, not to have any slides. I just have some brief remarks. I, I suspect you're going to have some questions for me. So I'll keep those brief. Um, so with that, I want to uh, thank the commission for the invitation to share my thoughts on, on genetic privacy. Um, and the views that I'm going to be talking about today are really, you know, my views and not, not those necessarily of Ancestry.com or Ancestry DNA. Um, and as you said, Ancestry.com is the world's largest online resource for family history. Uh, with our collection of billions, of billions of digitized records, our customers can research their family histories, build family trees, upload pictures, and, and share stories, which they do. Um, Ancestry DNA is a subsidiary of Ancestry.com, uh, and we recently launched a new service that allows customers to use genetics to trace their ethnic origins and find distant cousins. And Ancestry DNA's uh, service preserves and analyzes genetic information, genealogical pedigrees, historical records, and other information from people all around the world in order to better understand global population genetics and create products to help our customers make discoveries. And we hope that our research will be an invaluable tool for future generations and engage the interests of a wide range of scholars in genealogy, anthropology, evolution, and medicine. So as a provider of genetically derived information and stewards of genetic material, uh, Ancestry DNA understands its responsibilities to the customer. The entire service, from collection to banking, was designed with security and privacy in mind. For example, the DNA collection kit is designed to be anonymous. So no name or other personal identifiable information is included in the packaging. And by using a random alphanumeric code, which is linked to the personal identifiable information by the customer online, the anonymity of the individual is preserved throughout the testing process and beyond. In addition, all primary genetic information is stored in a, in a physically segregated server on multiple hard drives with limited and restricted access. We have conducted multiple third-party penetration tests to assess any weaknesses in our security. And I would say, in short, that the system is designed to require multiple independent and internal breaches of security to be compromised. Uh, and we plan to continue to, to learn and make the system more secure uh, as time goes by. Um, another point I want to make is that Ancestry uh, DNA took the position of being transparent. So our informed consent is approved by an institutional review board. Um, it's an opt-in consent. And we also voluntarily address the often overlooked issue of ownership by clearly stating in the terms and condition that the customer retains ownership of their DNA and their data. Ancestry DNA retains only a license to use it consistent with the informed consent. And I think, importantly, our privacy, uh, privacy policies and procedures have not been a reaction to public demand or outcry, outcry, and I would say quite the opposite. In a survey of Ancestry customers, only about 14 percent raised privacy as one of the reasons why they didn't purchase a previous version of the DNA test that we had. Instead, the primary barrier, barrier, cited, uh, barrier cited were cost and lack of understanding. So uh, we have been proactive in safeguarding the customer's information and genetic uh, material. Let me make just one other point that I, we were addressing uh, at the end of the last session uh, that sort of vexes me, and that is that even though we clearly put an emphasis on, private, on the private and sensitive nature of our customers' genetic data, uh, we should keep in perspective that our DNA is anything but secure, right? We leave it behind almost everywhere we go every day. And, you know, why would anyone wanting my genetic material spend the time and effort to hack into a secure data system when they can easily follow me to the nearest coffee shop and retrieve my used cup, okay? So I think that, you know, while uh, doing so I think is, is certainly reprehensible, to the best of my knowledge, it's not illegal <laughs> in terms of the identification of, of my, my genetic material. So 
In other words, there are realistic limits to what we can do, and I think while we should certainly take steps to mitigate these risks, um, it, it's something we should just keep in mind. So, thank you. I'll stop there and answer questions. There we go. We'll move to our next speaker and then get questions together. Great. Uh, and that is Dr. Uh, Laura Ryman Rodriguez. She is the Director of the Office of Policy, Communication, and Education for the National Human Genome Research Institute at the NIH. In her work at the uh, National Institutes of Health, she has assisted in shaping NIH policy for sharing genomic research data and has helped implement the genomic data sharing policy across that agency. And we're pleased to have you join us. Welcome. Thank you. And, and I'm going to break the trend and I'm going to use slides, but I'll, I'll do my best not to let them slow me down and hopefully they'll be useful in going through this. So I am here today to talk about um, how NIH has worked through the, the um, changing landscape, both scientifically and from an ethics perspective and a technological perspective, um, with advancing genomics research for public good um, while so many questions remain unanswered and, in fact, um, answers are continually um, being updated. So the, the focus of what I will talk about is the model that we created through um, the data sharing policy for genome-wide association studies, which has now been in place for approximately five years. And um, this policy created an expectation for sharing of whole genome information in a central NIH repository. Um, and so it was an extension of data sharing practices um, that had been in place in our, our long-held belief at NIH, but in, in this case it removed any type of um, monetary limit, whereas previously data sharing had come with um, a certain level of investment in a grant or an award. And this was based really on the nature of the data and the value of the data for the research community um, and the potential to return benefit from it. Um, we're guided through all of this. Um, by fundamental principle of maximizing public benefit from the research investment, um, and that investment is speaking to resources of the federal um, taxes, but also really the investment of the participants that contribute their time and their information, very sensitive and personal information, to the primary research studies which then come into the central resource. And embedded within this principle is also several values which we really look to in each of our policy mechanisms that we, we put in place to try to respect the participant interests, to promote the data sharing, and to have freedom to operate so that, again, there's the maximum amount of innovation and public good that can be returned from the community resource developed through the, the database. Um, you all have the policy, and so I'm, I'm going to walk through the, the model um, fairly quickly, but just to remind you, there's, there's different phases of this research, and it, and it does begin with a distributed system of the, the individual research studies, um, participants interacting with investigators where there is a relationship, and that relationship is scripted in some ways, at least from a paperwork perspective, through the informed consent document. And this, again, is something that NIH did in moving forward with the policy while we were going to focus on de-identified information, we did move beyond the regulatory boundaries and attach consent to the use of the data through this resource for the first time. And we did that by asking every institution that submits data um, to, the to the agency to tell us what the data use limitations will be based on the informed consent form that the participants signed at the time. Um, so that data is always used in subsequent um, time periods based on those parameters um, that, at least from the, the local institution's viewpoint, would be appropriate um, for that study population. In terms of privacy, we also advise because the primary institution will hold the, the identifiers. Again, we take everything in in a de-identified or coded way. Advise investigators and institutions to consider whether a certificate of confidentiality would be appropriate as a mechanism to attempt to safeguard um, the confidentiality of the participants in their studies. Once the data come into the data repository, um, again, I've already mentioned that all data is coming in in a coded way that was very intentional so that, again, the NIH is not holding any of 
the traditional identifiers. The standard that was adopted was um, the 18 identifiers from the privacy rule within HIPAA. Um, this was from both a practical standpoint and um, a desire to harmonize what our standards were across different regulations that were um, operating within trying to create this resource um, and accomplish the research at um, several different sites. We also, um, for the data repository, on my slide's not going forward anymore, um, but for the data repository, we did also um, seek a certificate of confidentiality, um, and this was after a great deal of internal debate as to whether or not that was appropriate or, or feasible because we were taking in de-identified information. And um, after the, the deliberations within the agency determined that, again, because of the volume and the nature of the data, um, while it was not directly identifiable, um, there were su um, sufficient data in there that um, it warranted this level of protection because of the various ways of, of as Ken mentioned, going back and, and matching the data through other sources that would not be related to our repository itself. Um, from a technical perspective, um, I'm, I'm not going to um, get into specifics here, um, partially because I can't talk about them um, very well, but partially I just want to mention that, of course, um, the security in terms of firewalls that are built and how the data is managed internally for the resource is layered based on the type of information um, that we have. So all data comes into the basic firewall within the National Center for Biotechnology Information. And then when it first comes in, it's behind another firewall that has a particularly high level of security because that is the data that we are still needing to confirm does not have any identifiers. Um, and then it, after that's been confirmed, it moves over to another layer. All of this is, is very much locked down even internally within NIH to only the dbGaP staff. Um, at the level of data users, there are also expectations for anyone that NIH provides access to that they are able to meet particular data security standards at their local institution. This is confirmed by their institutional officials as well as their local IT official um, so that we have every um, confirmation that we can reasonably get that they are in a place with the appropriate infrastructure to manage the data in a responsible way. Um, and then the final phase, of course, moving from the repository, the point of building in a repository is that so, so that secondary investigators can go out and use the information. And so, um, again, individual requests will come in for specific research purposes. These requests, as I'll talk about in a moment, are reviewed based on the data use limitations, and they're actually requested by their consent group. So the database is organized to reflect consent. Um, it has been designed um, from the beginning as a two-tiered system where some information at the higher meta level um, is, is in an open, publicly accessible database. And then the genotype information, the phenotype information, um, is all available through controlled access. And that is the controlled access portion where a specific research project has to be proposed. Um, that research use, if the data access is approved, is posted publicly so that there's transparency about who has, the ac who has data and what they're using it for. Um, the agreements are co-signed by the institutions, not just the investigator. And um, again, IT officials are named on all of those applications. And then we have um, data access committees. We actually have 15 at the moment. They're organized in some cases by scientific discipline so that they have the knowledge um, to evaluate the proposed research. Um, in other cases, um, they are by project based on the size of the data and the number of access requests expected. But the primary pur purpose of those access committees is to review um, the proposed research use with the data use limitations and then also to look at the infrastructure that's available for IT security to guard, safeguard the um, confidentiality of the participants. Um, you all also received in advance the data use certification agreement, so I'm not going to walk through the particular terms and conditions of use, but um, not surprisingly, we're very explicit within there about um, things that investigators that are approved for access should not do with regard to ensuring privacy and confidentiality, and again, also have several um, conditions that speak to um, only using the data for the approved research use, and again, that goes back to um, the level of respect and um, importance that we place on consent for future use of all of the data. There are also other intersecting um, regulations and laws that have to do um, with 
privacy around government records, which all of these data are when they come into the government database. The Freedom of Information Act is one. As I've stated, all of the data are again coded and de-identified. Um, so again, we had a policy question to ask ourselves um, because this then could be released under traditional circumstances. But um, after looking at, again, the volume and nature of the data, the NIH made a policy decision that um, they would intend to deny FOIA requests that came into this so that we could assure participants that we would not, that any access and use of the data would be for research purposes and it would come through this controlled access mechanism with the um, review by the Data Access Committee. This policy was looked at by a working group of our advisory committee to the director for the NIH director who took a look at all of our policies and protection mechanisms for this repository when it was first launched. And they recommended going beyond this policy level decision for the FOIA request and actually trying to seek a legislative exception so that the most robust protection could be available to again ensure the public um, that their data would be used for research purposes only. Similarly, um, compelled disclosure through subpoena authorities is another issue that we received a lot of comments on and that we had concerns about. Again, I've already mentioned the certificates of confidentiality that we put in place to try and protect that issue. Also within the policy, and I will finish up very quickly, um, we allow for exceptions to data deposition, recognizing the fact that there will be um, reasons not to de deposit the data where it's not appropriate in dbGaP. And some of those do have to do with places where we have very localized or identifiable populations and privacy may be a greater concern. Our data use experience, um, to date, I've, the numbers are up on the slides, and I've, the point here is just to note that the, the resource has been growing steadily. Um, there are over 300 studies in the resource now. We have um, over 3,500 approved projects. It is contributing greatly to the scientific literature and advancing our scientific knowledge. And our experience in terms of problems with this has been very low, relatively speaking, and they have largely revolved around technical issues, some small compliance issues, but nothing malicious has come through in our ability to monitor this. Stewardship is important. We've talked about trust. Um, before the other speakers have, and I think that's something that we also built into the system from the beginning. We have our top level um, leadership at the agency that engages in the policy and looks at how the policy is being implemented um, locally in terms of at the agency as well as um, extramurally on a regular basis. And that has proved um, fundamental to our ability to deal with changing technologies, changing methodologies that that um, alter the context of what is or is not identifiable in the data resource. Um, and then I'll just end, I guess, by, by projecting out to um, how this is all put together. I mentioned at the beginning that we're dependent upon a distributed system of research. And so there are protections in place at all of the local projects, the local institutions, there's oversight. And then at the highest level, there, there are national level policies and regulations that we're dependent upon and, and which we try to use as instruments to guide what happens at the finer grain. But all of this is happening in a context where around trust, where we have oversight and policy, researcher conduct and research community conduct contributing to the um, generation of public trust. And public trust is fundamental um, to the ongoing support of these activities and to participant willingness to actually contribute to the research. And without the participant willingness to contribute to the research, we will not move forward at all. And I will stop with that. Thank you very much. Um, well, actually, OK, I'll hold mine. I'll go <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Go ahead, and I've got uh, so I, Amy I, first and then John. I want to say something and ask a question about coffee cups, okay? <laughs> because we hear over and over again the true statement that you can take my coffee cup and seek, you know, get all the information of, out of this that I can get by going, you know, uh, asking for my whole genome to be sequenced, right? So here's... I think, and I want your reaction, here's the important point that that makes and the important points that it leaves unresolved, right? I think the important point that it makes is that the questions about respect for persons and privacy and whole genome sequencing do not boil down to ownership, right? Because um, I can't own what I leave behind. It's just, it's whether, right? I'm spilling it, and I'm leaving it. <laughs> and I spill it all over the place, right? Um, 
<laughs> so, however, I mean, so I think that's a very important point to recognize. Um, if ought implies can, you just cannot assert ownership over your genetic material in the sense that you leave it behind all the time. However, the interesting fact, which I want to then ask a question about, is that we have all these protections about how it's used. And I think that's the point a number of people have made, Nita and Christine and others, which is we still care about the particular uses. We legally care about it and we morally care about it. And I just want, I'll give the simple example about why that's rational to do so. Imagine a world, and it's a world that could exist in our world, where some political group who wanted to cleanse our society of genetically inferior people organized. They're allowed politically every legal right to do so. And they went around picking up these cups, knowing, identifying whose genome sequencing it was, publicizing it widely, and calling for the eradication of the the people they saw as genetically inferior. That would be a nightmare. They might not violate any, they might not violate any law depending on how they went about it, but it would be uh, a moral nightmare. And therefore, we applaud organizations like yours that put into place restrictions on how you'll use it. And my question to you is, what kinds of restrictions do you think are, you know, we should as a commission care about saying are necessary to have the trust that you both care about a lot so that people can feel free to contribute to what will make them know more but also contribute to the public good. It's a big question but I think it's important for us to get that out because it's what this commission really cares about. So, uh, you, I mean, we're both going to go. Oh, I go first. Okay, fair enough. Um, I, yeah. So I raised that issue. Obviously, you, the committee has has contemplated, and I just want to make sure that that no you know, no question. I mean, we put a lot of emphasis on it, but there's other ways to get it right. So that that loophole exists, and I think a, a bad actor is more likely to you know target someone and go after that genetic material specifically than trying to go after broad de-identified information and then try to re-identify one specific person, okay? So in terms of your question, what I, it seems to me that um, having a, you know, something that sort of protects an individual at sort of the last point in terms of public, you know, public, uh, publicizing or, or disseminating genetic information being, you know, having some consequences, legal consequences at that point seem reasonable and I think if it's done in, in a way that isn't you know, overly complicated, but just simple and straightforward that says that dissemination or use of that information in any manner that harms the individual list those issues, I think is reasonable. I think what I like about that is and it gives us a lot of freedom between where we are today and there. And I think, you know, my concern is if we try to get too complicated um, then we are, you know, unfortunately, you know, can't see all the consequences and can't see into the future. And I think we may get ourselves in a situation that we regret later. So to me, I would, I would try to go to the extreme, if you will, and just create something simple to that extent. Sounds like our principle of regulatory parsimony. Yes. <laughs> and, and I would concur with the fact that simplicity here is probably what would be um, most beneficial and just because it's very hard to parse out exactly what would be appropriate today versus in the future. And so um, I think one of the other keys it's identified is in each case, whether it's the private sec um, system that Ken was talking about or a public database for research purposes, there's been some level of, of voluntary willingness to contribute the DNA, the genomic information to whatever cause, whatever purpose you as an individual are seeking to gain the benefit of. And so respecting that in, in I think would be fundamental. And then there may be some, you know, few cases that could be identified um, where there could be harm, discriminatory practices. We have, you know, the Genetic Non-Discrimination non Act that's already in place for some situations, but not all situations. Um, and so I think it really does come down to protecting who can have access under what circumstances um, that largely involve individual willingness and then also um, general good and not harm in terms of the use. Actually, I've got John and Nita next, but I've, 
I've got to follow, <laughs> follow on this one because it was actually the question I had in my mind. To, to what degree can we really separate um, data use and data access? Um, and, and if we were to, as a commission, recommend pretty strong controls on data access, for example, does that leave enough room to do good science out of data use? Right? For example, I can ask Google how many people are pinging a website, or I can ask someone how many people are pinging a website, and that's a question about, that, that's a use question, as opposed to asking them, I would like a list of all of your people to determine how many are, are pinging a website. Can we, in fact, control access to genomic data, still good do, do good science, uh, because we can be, um, uh, we can be more prescriptive about the use of those data. Can those things be separated? Um, I'm not sure I would go so far as to say exactly how they can be separated. In, in my world, they're very much tied together. And I think you would want to keep um, them linked so that access is only appropriate if you have a use that's um, Con consistent with what, again, the individual has provided for. So for research purposes... I'm actually asking the yeah. reverse. Is there an expectation that we must give access in order to do good science, in order to have scientific use? So in that regard, I would say that it, it comes down to um, if, if the access is not provided in appropriate ways, it constrains the questions that can be asked. Uh, I need to be educated about the certificates of confidentiality. I understand that, I mean, I, I think it's admirable that you, you are, as a matter of policy, requesting this from all users. Uh, but I also understand that a very small proportion of uh, users out there actually offer such certificates um, in the wild, as it were. Um, so, you know, what, what are the What's the coverage of a, of a certificate of confidentiality? Uh, how large and fine-grained are its teeth? Uh, and what sort of protection do they offer with regard to inquiries from, say, uh, law enforcement or homeland security? Okay, so um, certificates of confidentiality, I'll just um, start with the fact that they're not perfect. And, and acknowledge that up front. I think um, it's an existing mechanism that we have, and the coverage, um, to speak to your question, is by study. At this point, the way that it has been implemented um, under the Secretary's authority is study by study, which is why we can advise individual investigators that are collecting genomic information with identifiers to consider the appropriateness of requesting a certificate, but we can't automatically, at this point in time, issue it for genomic information. Um, the extent of the coverage, they, there are varying reports as to whether or not they, they work, whether or not the courts will um, honor them. It is a, it's a protection against compelled disclosure, too, so that's very important because anyone can volunteer it. Um, and so when the investigator is providing a certificate, he's saying um, and promising that he won't do it under compelled circumstances. Um, except for certain reasons of, of public health that are spelled out. Um, but if the individual notes to someone that they are in the study or the investigator might decide or an institution might decide. So it is not fail safe. And again, it is another area where um, some stronger protection um, could be helpful to, to, to engender better or more public trust. And, and we looked at those issues. Um, and, and try to think what we could do, and the mechanism that we have used was the extent that we could go under existing policy um, in terms of the, keeping it by a project-by-project project basis, seeking one for our project in dbGaP. Quick um, follow-up. Uh, so w what amount of extra additional protection does a certificate of confidentiality provide? over and above the boilerplate confidentiality information in an informed consent form? So it is designed to provide a level of protection, um, a grant of protection from subpoenas so that it can be used in court. The, the concept is that it can be used in court so that an institution can say, I will not provide under the protection of this grant from the, the authority of the Secretary of Health and Human Services the identifiers um, that I may possess 
for um, this study because I have been granted a certificate of confidentiality. So as you can tell, we have been uh, thinking about this use versus access uh, issue a good bit, and I think both of your uh, comments today were really helpful in articulating that, and I want to follow up a bit on Amy's question about thinking about the difference, different types of uses that we might need to restrict um, if we were to ensure the trust of individuals. So trust whether it's to participate in studies, trust to use commercial services, um, and uh, my, my intuition hearing the conversation is that restriction on access is only needed if we don't have restrictions on use, right? The reason you would restrict somebody's access to it is because you don't have adequate protections on the other end against potential nefarious uses. And if you had adequate protections for potential nefarious uses, then you wouldn't need to restrict access unless there's some independent reason beyond that that we think individuals' trust would be compromised. And so thinking about some of the areas in which um, you, you might want to have restrictions on use, uh, discrimination, so beyond GINA likely, beyond employment and insurance for other purposes as well, including probably those you know, that Amy mentioned. Or um, like a number of states have done, prohibiting the impermissible sequencing of information that isn't your own, notwithstanding a separate conversation about property and who owns it. Um, and so that would prevent the average person who picks it up on the street from being able to actually sequence the information. Are there other ones beyond discrimination or somebody who you know, picks up the coffee cup being unable to use it um, that would be needed? And do you agree with my intuition that if you had adequate protection on use, that you wouldn't need to restrict the flow of access of the information? Just, I, I just want to say that the second qualification that Nita made is very important, that someone can't sequence someone else's genome, that inherently recognizes a kind of default privacy interest in that even though it's out there, just picking it up and sending it to your lab or, and under false pretenses is considered wrong. I mean, that's yeah. just a, a base. Well, I mean, so, so there's, there's a lot of reasons why you might have that. A it could be discrimination. It could be property, and there's a separate kind of view of property than the one you advance, but yes. It, it could be. There, I yeah. think there are lots. I think this is an important point. I just think we're all, there are a lot of reasons that converge yeah. there. But please answer me to say yeah. that that second, that second qualification packs in a default concern about the identification of individuals with their genetic material. Well, and about 25 states have some sort of restriction already on that, which is the individual picking up the coffee cup and being able to actually sequence the information if it isn't their own, so. It, okay. Yeah. So, so I think the, the short answer is, for me, I think it goes a long way, and maybe the answer is just yes. I do think that if we can sort of block that end you know, nefarious use, I think it goes a long way. I, my, my, my thing, what's interesting from a commercial standpoint is we, um, a lot of uh, customers get data from either us or from other services. And what I see that's um, a little disturbing sometimes is that they upload their data to sites that, quite frankly, I can't even have, you know, I try to research who these individuals are that are doing additional research on on people's data, and I, I'm not even sure who they who they are, how they're qualified, and if the data that they're getting back are, are even you know valid, right? So the point is that I think that we are moving in in, in a direction where consumers feel comfortable, rightly <laughs> or through ignorance, you know, uploading their data to other sites. So I, I do think that restricting sort of the end I think is important, um, just to be able to take care of that issue. But the other one is just from a research standpoint. The reality is, is the amounts of data that we're looking to get are, I think it's unreasonable to think that our current research institutions or anyone really could, could do all of the research that could possibly be done, right? And there's research that are, you know, important to certain subsets of our, you know, uh, of society that are not necessarily going to be of interest to, to researchers. And I think people are going to start taking it upon themselves to start doing research. And you're seeing that through advocacy groups and things like that. And so I think being able to, the more access we can give and feel comfortable, I think we would certainly be moving our mission forward of extracting as much information from this genetic information as possible.
I just had a short question for uh, Dr. Shaheen. Um, in your privacy statement, uh, Ancestry DNA speaks about uh, aggregating uh, individuals for targeted advertising displays, and I just wondered how that uh, is done in the in the field in general, and and uh, does this include genetic or only demographic information? So maybe I'm not. When you say aggregated information, you're talking about genetic bundle individuals information into groups for targeted ad displays. Um, in terms of the ancestry DNA, we don't have anything on displaying the information. What we do is we talk about aggregating the data to potentially improve the population genetics through both genetics and pedigree information. But in terms of advertising, is that what you're, yes, you're getting yes. at? Uh, we, on the genetic side, we do not, uh, we don't have any advertisement uh, whatsoever in terms of uh, that data. Laura, um, I wanted to thank you both, first of all. Uh, I wanted to follow up with a question that builds a little bit on what Nina was talking about and ask about the public access versus controlled access data from dbGaP. Do we have any information about how often public access, publicly accessible data through dbGaP has been useful for scientific purposes? And do we have any idea who uses it? Um, so on the open access side, we can't track who is using it, so we have a list of IP addresses, but we don't know um, what they're looking at. We also, therefore, then can't track what's coming out of it. Um, at this point, for dbGaP purposes, the information that is, is there publicly that from a data perspective, our aggregate level information on the clinical um, side or the phenotypic side, but all of the genomic data has been moved behind controlled access now. Um, and so there's some information that's of, of sort of very superficial value to the scientific community to get um, goals around allele frequencies so that they can do some quick comparisons, but it is something that we hear from the community that some of the basic descriptive information from aggregate genomic data is not available publicly that could be very helpful, and they actually have to apply for the individual level data um, to get even just aggregate, even if that's only what they have asked. We've recent, just this week, have um, put out a pooled set of aggregate data so that through one request, it's still behind controlled access, but it's one request so that scientists can come in and, and have access to 14 general research use studies so that those that are just looking for large volumes of aggregate data or to cross-check what they're seeing in their study with what has been seen in many other populations, they can do that more simply and not um, have to go through the um, individual request process or gain access to data they don't need, which is an important policy um, concern. And, and so what I can also say is that for other data that's not part of dbGaP, but for things like the HapMap project or 1,000 Genomes that NIH also runs where there was very um, broad consent for future use and for open internet accessible um, data release, those, the numbers that we have on that in terms of people accessing it far exceed the numbers of people accessing dbGaP. So we do know that disciplines beyond biology or other things will use the large volumes of data accessible through those open access portals. And we are restricting by, by virtue of the controls we've put in place for controlled access, um, who is coming to the data. And so that's, again, a, a pressure point that we seek to balance in trying to, to work through the policy. And I guess I would add in response to Nita's question, too, about um, the access. I think um, having broad controls or um, protections in place for appropriate use would indeed be outstanding from my perspective to have um, and engender a great deal of public trust. But I think you would still need to contend with, as a society, the wide variety of individual and cultural preferences around use and access to the data that couldn't be encompassed and just solved through some higher level um, legislative protections or, or other things. So those would be important. It would be, it would be important to have teeth to those um, bans, but I don't think they will cover the waterfront of questions and issues from the ethics perspective of how the data are used. Thank you. And we have, uh, finally, from uh, the audience, Dr. Edward Gabriel, who's a senior healthcare ethicist in Navy. Navy medicine, in addition to reminding us that um, uh, informed consent is, in fact, a uh, process of human trust, 
He's asking a very practical question. Uh, how confident are we, given the current state of DNA science and where we imagine that it's going to go, that de-identification is absolute? So I, I'm going to speak for myself right now um, and say that I, I don't think that de-identification is absolute. I think even in the five years that we have had um, DB gap going and the policy in place, um, it has shifted dramatically um, because with the increased power of the statistics that we make possible by large data sets, it changes um, what is possible in terms of identifying unique patterns. And then again, with the amount of information outside of our resource that is available publicly, um, direct to consumer access to the technology to create sequence information matching becomes an increasing, increasingly reasonable thing that can happen. And I would, I would absolutely agree. I, there's no, there's no question that it's going. I, I think we should operate under the assumption that if it is to identify, if it is, uh, if it's hard to re-identify today, it won't be tomorrow or sometime in the future. And we should always keep that in mind. We will be taking a very brief break and trying to reconvene as close to 11 o'clock as possible. But before we do, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, Dr. Shaheen, thank you both thank for your contributions. You.